Hi. My name is Scott Youngblood. I'm a physician, and I'm here to defend science and patient autonomy. Next slide. The best way to look at any medical issue is with a randomized controlled trial. A well-performed RCT is more powerful than dozens of observational studies because it has a control group. That's what Pfizer did to evaluate its vaccine uh, in, to get an EUA. It had 44,000 patients, two large groups, essentially equal in all respects except one group gets the vaccine and the other group gets the placebo. Next slide. Everyone has heard that the study showed excellent vaccine efficacy with a lower rate of symptomatic infections over six months. Next slide. It was also great in preventing severe COVID cases. These patients are really sick. You have a high heart rate, respiratory failure, renal, hepatic, neurologic dysfunction, ICU admission, and death. There was only one case of this in the vaccine group and 30 cases in the placebo group. Next slide. But what hasn't been talked about is the increased adverse events for the vaccine. The total adverse events twice as high, related adverse events four times as high, severe adverse events twice as high. Essentially, those are hospitalizations, heart attacks, strokes, myopericarditis, Guillain-Barre, et cetera. All of these differences were highly statistically significant. Next slide. And the endpoint that we should all care about the most, which is all-cause mortality, this is the, the great endpoint because it ends all of the silly arguments about what caused the death. Was it the vaccine, the virus, or something else? You just total up the deaths, and at the end of six months, you look at them. And in this study, 15 patients died in the vaccine group versus 14 in the placebo group. And then the patients were unblinded and allowed to cross over if they had gotten placebo and wanted the vaccine. Five additional patients who got the vaccine died, but none who remained in the placebo group died. This mortality difference is not statistically significant. It doesn't prove anything other than scientifically, one cannot say that this vaccine saves lives. Next slide. And this raises the big question, if the vaccine is so effective against the virus, preventing infections and severe COVID, then why didn't it, didn't it save lives at the height of the pandemic against the Alpha variant? The most likely answer is that the risks of this vaccine essentially canceled out any COVID benefit from the vaccine. Regardless, there was no death benefit. Next slide. And that really is the big problem with this obsessive fixation on COVID infections and death. Is it the vaccinated or the unvaccinated that misses half the problem? The adverse events and deaths from the vaccine. If you survive the vaccine, you will probably be better off when you meet the virus, especially early on, but at what cost? Indeed, the Taiwan Department of Health states right now that slightly more people have died from the COVID vaccines this year than the virus itself. Next slide. The problem is the alpha spike protein, which all the vaccines make. It's a toxin in and of itself. It binds to your ACE2 receptors around your body, which are critical in regulating blood pressure, clotting, immune system. Having spike in your body attacking these receptors is a big problem. Next slide. We've been told not to trust VAERS, but it is the only database available. All the COVID vaccines were also granted EUAs with the requirements removed for ethics boards, data safety monitoring boards, or critical event committees. Committees, All of these are customary for anything on an EUA. We are for some reason intentionally flying blind. OSHA just said they are suspending the rule for employers to report adverse events due to mandated COVID vaccines. As an ethical physician, I cannot defend anything on this slide. Next slide. So VAERS is an early warning system, so if a problem is identified, it can be investigated further. It is 31 years old. It is voluntary. There is significant underreporting. Submission of a false report is subject to prosecution, and the CDC validates all these entries. Over 150,000 have been re removed just this year. Next slide. There were about 158 deaths on average per year associated with all vaccines. And then something happens in January of 2021. We now have over 17,000 deaths reported just for the COVID vaccines. I would submit to you that as an early warning system, VAERS is working exactly as intended. We are just not listening to it. Next slide. Nearly 40% of these deaths occur within 48 hours of the shot. It is not until day 40 or so that the death rates return to baseline. If there was no relation, you would see that the low baseline on the right of the graph would be all the way over to the left. Something is happening at day zero to cause these deaths, and it's pretty obvious what that is. Next slide. The CDC states that any death within 28 days of a positive test, regardless of cause, counts as a COVID death. You could get run over by a cement truck crossing the street, but if your COVID test three weeks ago was positive, you are counted as a COVID death. On the other hand, anything within 28 days of a vaccine is not related to the vaccine. Imagine the world that we would live in if these assumptions were reversed. This is illogical and indefensible. Next slide. 
During the Pfizer vaccine brief before the EUA last October, uh, this slide was flashed up for about one second. It lists out all the adverse events that eventually turned up in VAERS months later. Heart attacks, strokes, myocarditis, pericarditis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, blood clots, deaths, and enhanced uh, vaccine disease. Regardless, the FDA granted the EUA without any mention of any of this in the notices to physicians or patients. They knew about it and apparently said nothing. Perhaps the fact checkers can defend this, but I cannot. Next slide. On August 23rd, the FDA sent out two letters. The first approved the Comirnaty vaccine and the second extended the EUA for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the same formulation but legally distinct. To this day, there are no FDA-approved COVID vaccines that are actually available in the United States. Comirnaty is not available. So if the FDA approves the vaccine, but it is not actually available to anyone, it begs the question, did the FDA actually approve the vaccine? Next slide. In late July, the CDC stated the viral titers of saliva in the vaccinated are just as high as the unvaccinated. This was the justification to make everything, everyone put their masks back on. The viral levels in your saliva are the measure of how infectious you are. Thus, claims that the unvaccinated are spreading the disease and paradoxically putting the vaccinated at risk are all nonsensical. This fact alone destroys the infectious spread justification for vaccine mandates. Next slide. In the age of Delta, vaccines do not meaningfully reduce transmission or stop infections. They do not reduce overall med medical uh, resource utilization as we showed. The uh, best evidence available shows that they do not uh, reduce mortality. And since it uses the alpha spike protein, you will get 100% of the risks, but only 40 to 60% of the benefit in the age of uh, Delta the virus has moved on. The vaccines produce narrow immunity that encourages new variants. Their efficacy wanes after six to eight months. And for COVID survivors, it likely produces no long-term benefit, and they are known to have a two to six times higher rate of adverse events. Likely no benefit, just harm. Having said all of this, they may offer a personal health benefit to these vaccines, but that analysis needs to be individualized. Next slide. The bottom line is that this issue is really complicated. The decision for COVID vaccination should be left up to the patient in consultation with their doctor. There is no medical or scientific justification for COVID vaccine mandates by a government or employers. Thank you. Yeah.